He's got a plan for all of us, even in these last days. I was reminded of that over and over and over again at the conference. So look at your life as an overcomer. Look at your life as a conqueror. Look at your life as being totally equipped for what God is leading you to do. Because where God guides, God provides. Amen. My good friend, Pastor Carl Galps is with us to share with us what the Lord has laid on your heart. Come on, brother. All right, I've got a little song I want to play for you. I'm kidding. Brother Layton said, hey, he said I could use his guitar. You know what I'm saying? You, uh, <laughs> after I preach, you might prefer you heard another preacher, but after I sing, I know you're going to want Brother Layton back. I promise. So we won't, we, won't, we won't do that. Pastor, Dr. Reverend, Brother Mike Spaulding. This man is loved all over this nation, y'all. And you guys know that. You know that. Probably all over the world, actually. But, but, um, but I, I, I do love, I do love Pastor Mike, and I'm so honored that you would allow me in your pulpit this morning and to bring your precious flock a word. And may the Lord bless you and keep you and honor you always. I'll try not to tear your church up, brother. I promise. I, <laughs> no, no. Are you guys ready to enjoy the Word of God this morning? How about standing for just a moment? Stand. Just kind of stretch. Stretch your back a little bit. Don't want anybody falling asleep while I preach. Okay. Now let's start by giving the Lord a hand of praise to Jesus. Amen. Amen. To Him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Stay standing. Pray with me if you would. Father, we thank you, first of all, for another day of life. Every breath we take, every beat of our heart, it comes from your hands. Let us not take that for granted. I know, Lord, that the, just the living of life is a great blessing, and sometimes we do take for granted. We take for granted we're going to get up the next day. But, Lord, so today as we worship together and as we gather around the Word, and as the Word is brought alive to our, in the theater of our mind and our soul by your Holy Spirit, I pray that we would just say, wow, thank you, Lord, for life, for loving us, for your grace, for your mercy. And so for all of that and so much more, we worship you. Now, Father, by your Holy Spirit, illuminate this word to us. Surround this place by your holy angels. Hold back anything evil and dark and let the light shine in this place this morning. In the heart, the soul, the mind of every man, woman, young man, young woman, boy and girl. And we pray that you, Jesus, are exalted. Your word is exalted. And we pray that everything that we bring forward now and that we study in your word will be pleasing in your sight. We come to the word to experience the living word, Jesus. And it's in your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 Y'all can be seated. You ready to enjoy the word? Open your Bibles. Open your Bibles. I know you have your Bible, right? This church is supposed to have your Bible. Matthew chapter 4. Find Matthew chapter 4. And I can't wait to get there. Matthew chapter 4. Calvary Chapel, Lima, Ohio. I have to stop and pause because we do a lot of missions work in Lima, Peru. See, and so I'm always saying Lima, 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 Lima. And so then I come to Lima, Ohio, right? I, mean, I bet people mess that up, right? Yeah, yeah. So you're probably sick of hearing that and everything. But, but, then, but then I've been pastoring. As a matter of fact, I've been pastoring one church for 33 years. There's something wrong with us folks. <laughs> but anyway, bless their hearts. But in that church, excuse me, in that community is a Catholic church, St. Rose of Lima. So, you know, so I used to love lima beans, but I have to call them lima beans now because that's, you know, Lima, Peru, St. Rose of Lima. Everything's Lima, Lima, Lima. So I come up here, and it's hard for me. I have to get my tongue and my brain wrapped around Lima, Ohio. But I know what lima beans are, and lima, and I know the word, but I'm just, what difference did any of that make? I don't know. I'm sorry. I just wanted to say thank you. I'm honored to be here. 
And uh, this is my first time in Lima, Ohio. You guys are awesome. Just two and a half hours north of here is where I was raised until I was about 10. My father was a professor at the University of Michigan in the School of Business. And so we lived in Ann Arbor and Flint and Fenton, that area, if you, if you know where that is. But I haven't seen that area since I left there. And I have a lot of awesome memories from that area. I told my wife, I said, man, I wish we had like one more day that we could take, rent a car and go up and just kind of see the places where I kicked around and grew up. But anyway, at the age of 10, we moved back to Florida uh, where I was born. And then my father was retired for 30 years, professor at Florida State University School of Business. And, and I grew up in that area, Tallahassee, Monticello. You probably don't know where all that is, but that's where I grew up. Um, and uh, so I've just kind of always wanted to go back. But I, I, I started school and I turned 11 as I entered sixth grade there. And grew up in that community, and I met the little girl that would be my wife when I was 11 years old. And, and, and we were buddies back then and all through school. And, and then uh, right out of high school, we married, and we've been together ever since. And we've been to school together. We've been around the world together. We've been in careers together. We've been in ministry together now for a long time. And um, so she still has to, uh, you know, she, she takes... I, I couldn't do anything without her. I mean, I can read the roll of her eyes. Okay, for example. <laughs> I mean, and I know. She doesn't have to say a word, just. <laughs> right, Brother Mike? <laughs> so anyway, but she's she's uh, precious. And she's back there in the back. Pam, just raise your hand just so people know. That's my wife, Pam. <laughs> yeah, right in the back corner, in the very back corner. Brilliant woman and loves the Lord and is a great inspiration to me. And, you know, and the Lord often uses her as the Holy Spirit in my life. <laughs> men, can you say amen to that? I mean, you know, so that's really cool too. But um, anyway, I just wanted to thank you. Pastor Mike Lima. I know, I know, I'm messing with you. <laughs> See, she takes this serious. <laughs> Everybody else was laughing. She goes, it's Lima. Come on, sugar, this church now, please. <laughs> oh, goodness. Listen, you ready to enjoy the Word? I want to take you on a journey this morning. We're going to go to, a, to the Word. We're going to go to a passage of Scripture, a portion of Scripture that um, should be very familiar to you. You've probably studied it in Sunday school lessons. You've heard it in sermons a lot down through the years and wherever you've been in churches. A lot, I mean, you know, the word is the word, so you're going to hear it again, except this morning, with the Lord's help and the Holy Spirit power, we're going to infuse it with some context and some understanding that I think will blow your mind and your spirit and your soul. And I pray that it will bless you, and I pray that when you leave here, you will have a sweeter and maybe just a little deeper walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? Well, here's what I want to do. I want to start, we're going to, we're, we're, the, the, the crux is going to be the first section of what we call the Sermon on the Mount. But I want to come back just a few verses before in chapter 4, verse 23. And I want to set the scene just a moment because this is something that a lot of people um, forget when we come to the Sermon on the Mount. You know, it's just, you know, everybody loves the, the, the blessed bees, you know, the blessed, blessed art thou, blessed art thou, blessed art thou. And we like saying it in the King James English, blessed, blessed art thou, you know. And that's beautiful, but it's so much more than that, and it's so deeper than that, and I can't wait to share all that with you. But right now, I want you to see who all was there, because that's important. Look at chapter 4, verse 23. So Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria. Just a minute, you're going to see the crowds are going to come. Some of them are going to come from Syria. And people brought to him all who were ill and very, with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed. Yeah. The darkness is always there. Those having seizures and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee and the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea 
and the region across the Jordan followed him. You get this? People from the what now are the nation of Syria, the nation of Jordan, all over Judea. The Decapolis, Decapolis, that's a, a region of ten Roman cities. It was a region, a county, if you will, put it in our terms, that was a part of the Roman Empire. All over Galilee, the villages and the hamlets and the, and the towns, Lake Galilee and all around it. And they would come across the lake. They would come around the lake, up through the Jordan River Valley. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And this is early on in his ministry. It was really exploding. And so Jesus would settle his ministry in the region of Galilee around the village of Capernaum. That's how we say it in the English. It comes from the conflagration of two Hebrew words, Kafir Nahum. Kafir Nahum. Kafir means village. Nahum, the prophet Nahum. Right? But it means comfort, the comforter. The village of the comforter is where Jesus chose to make his headquarter ministry. Hung around Peter's house a lot. And usually when it talks about they went home, that's usually where they went, Peter's house there at Capernaum. He called his disciples, a lot of them, from right there along those shores. A bunch of fishermen, my kind of folks. And so that's where they are. The region of Galilee. It's early in his ministry. But the power of heaven is coming down through every word he speaks. The miracles he performs come right out of the, they jump, they pop off the pages of the Old Testament Scripture, what we would call Old Testament. They would call it back then the law and the prophets. In fact, you're going to see this in a moment, the law and the prophets. Whenever you see that in the New Testament, it's basically the New Testament way of 2,000 years ago of saying the word of God. Because remember, they didn't have the New Testament until, you know, a decade, two or three before the, before the Gospels were beginning to be written. And then the Apostle Paul was saved, and then he would begin writing the letters to the churches. And, you know, it would be in the 90 A.D.s before John would have the revelation. So, so, so the Word of God that even the early church used was what we would call the Old Testament. The, but, but they didn't call it the Old Testament. There was no New Testament. And nowadays you say, yeah, but the proper word is Tanakh. Well, Tanakh, that's what it's called now. But that didn't start until a couple of hundred years after the time of Christ because what they did was kind of canonize what we would call the Old Testament in, in a formal way. And then they took, it was a, the, the word Tanakh is an acrostic for the Hebrew words that make up the different divisions of the Old Testament. So, so now you hear people say, it's the Tanakh, it's the Tanakh, it's the Tanakh. Well, that's the Hebrew word for that. But, but in the New Testament, in the New Testament, you'll hear it called the Law and the Prophets. Sometimes you'll hear it called the Law. Sometimes you'll hear it called the Prophets. And within the context, you can figure out if they mean the whole Word of God or a specific group of prophets. I'm not trying to sound professorial, but I want you to understand this because Jesus is going to speak about the Law and the Prophets. So whenever you see that, just, just insert the word, the Word of God. Okay? The Word of God. Okay? Now that'll help a lot here in just a moment. So... Now that we know who all is there, I'm going <laughs> did I tear something up? Okay. Now that we know who all is there, from Syria, from Jordan, from all, all over the area, crowds, massive crowds, maybe thousands that day, Jesus is outside of Capernaum. He's up on a hillside. I, I've been blessed to be right there. Have any of you been right there in Galilee? And that, okay, some of you have. So, so you, you already can smell the air and feel the, the breeze and hear the birds and the seagulls and watching them dive out in the lake and you see the fishermen and the boats. Okay, so you've already been there. Uh, but, but on that day 2,000 years ago, I mean 2,000 years ago, there were no airplanes flying over and automobiles and horns honking. It was just the breeze blowing in your ears and the seagulls diving into the lake and the children laughing and the crowds gathering and the murmuring of the people. And he goes up and he takes his place on the side of this hill where his voice, his booming voice, will travel into the crowds. But for weeks, he had already been healing and preaching and speaking. And news of him went up into Syria and over into Jordan and all over parts of the Roman Empire in that area of the world. Now he's going to preach. 
thousands of people have gathered. And he's going to blow their minds. Now, I, I mean, you're going to find out in a moment. It bo- you, when we read it, it's a Sunday school lesson. We, we've seen it all of our lives. When those people heard these words, it blew their minds. It opened up their spirits and their, and their souls to the throne of God like they had never had happened in a synagogue. And the Pharisees that were there, oh, and they were there. Because news of these kind of crowds and these kind of miracles, oh, it attracted the religious elite. Some of them, I think, were genuinely attracted and genuine, genuinely wanted to know maybe this was the Messiah. Maybe this, at least maybe he's the forerunner of Messiah. So I'm not, you know, I'm not disparaging them all. But it doesn't take long to get into the New Testament before we find out most of them are just begin to be filled with pride and jealousy and envy. And, and they start seeking for ways to kill him. You know, the religious leaders that are mad that he's breaking their laws while they're getting ready to commit murder. You know, those people. Mm-hmm. Okay. You got it? I'm going to share so much more with you in a moment, but just look at what you've already seen before and listen. Chapter 5, verse 1. So, now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and he sat down. His disciples came into him. All the people were before him, and then he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled. And blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they, they, they will see God. And blessed are the peacemakers, for these will be called, in Hebrew it would be, for these would be called the nail in him, children of God, the sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you, people uh, persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. (laughs) We'll come back to that in a moment. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven for the same way they persecuted the prophets that were before you. And don't you know that you are the salt of the earth? And if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. And you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people put a lamp under a basket. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before the world that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the word of God. See, it says law and prophets. I did not come to abolish the word of God, but I came to fulfill it. And I tell you the truth. Until heaven and earth disappears, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from God's word until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments of God's word and then teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not even enter the kingdom of heaven. Oh, my gosh. Now you see why they wanted to kill him? (laughs) All right, now listen to me. This is so important. Context. Those people in those crowds, probably most of them were of the Jewish faith, but not necessarily all of them, because, I mean, the word of this miracle worker, this man that was bringing heaven down (laughs) to the people by his words, I mean, that word was spreading all over the, the region. Probably most of them, because... In that day, 
Jewish people were looking for and longing for Messiah. Not Messiah as we know him, but they were looking for a political, religious leader, a military figure, somebody that could deliver them from the, cr- cr- the clutches of the Roman Empire, somebody that could make them uh, an empire again like King David, King Solomon. We need this, this Messiah, Messiah ben David in Hebrew, the son of David. Maybe this guy is him. And so they were hearing about the miracles. No, nobody had ever seen anything like this before. And by the way, nobody's ever seen anything genuinely like this since. Like the things Jesus did. Never before, never since. So news spread, and here they came. Now follow me. To the vast majority of the crowd that day, they had grown up under the teachings of the rabbis. They had grown up under the teachings of the Pharisees, the teachers of the laws. They had grown up going to synagogue. They had never heard anything like this. To paraphrase it, what they had heard was they would have a liturgy. The prayers were written. The prayers were read. The prayers were memorized. They would come back and forth with the prayers. There were certain scriptures in the liturgy that would be read aloud, and there were a whole lot of scriptures that were never read to the people. Some of them would be expounded upon. Some of them would be debated in the service, and it would be a big open free-for-all sometimes. Some songs would be sung. If the scriptures were expounded on by the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, it would usually be the writings of, of the commentators of their age, the rabbis that came before them that they had interpreted the scriptures. And so then the job of the rabbi in in the age that Jesus was there, they would meet in conclaves. This was their job. They would, you know, you know, business people would get up and go to the office, get up and go to the shop, get up and go to the farm, get up and go. But these guys would get up and go to their meetings and they would debate and discuss the scriptures all day long, mainly looking for anything in the Bible that was a thou shalt or thou shalt not and trying to figure out exactly how to live that in rules and regulations so that God would love them or that God kind of owed them because they were keeping the law. So for example, when the Bible says and the Ten Commandments say, keep the Sabbath, keep it holy, okay, that's, that's pretty clear, just you know, but the rabbis in Jesus' day, by the time Jesus arrived, they had invented, they had sat around their tables in their conclaves. This was their job. It's, it's, it's almost like they felt like they weren't earning their pay if they weren't passing laws. I'm so glad there's nothing like that in our culture. It's like, oh. <laughs> it was just like that. It was just like that. So every few weeks there was a new rule, a new regulation, a new, a new twist to how to keep the Sabbath, a new twist to how to live so that God kind of owed you, you know. I mean, it wasn't quite that black and white as far as God owing, but that's, that was the whole purpose. That was the whole thought behind it. So, so by the time you get to Jesus' day, for that one commandment, they had devised 3,000 rules and regulations about how to keep the Sabbath. 3,000. You, you can look this up. I'm not lying to you. That's why when you go to the New Testament and you hear these descriptions, it was about a Sabbath day's journey from Jerusalem to Bethlehem or to Bethany. You say, well, what does that mean, a Sabbath day's journey? Oh, that's a, that was a law of the Pharisees. It was a law of the Pharisees. You could only take so many steps on the Sabbath day. They would actually have up like what we would call mile markers. I, I don't know what they call them, but they would actually have them up between villages and cities so that you would know if you had traveled from one to another, you could keep a tally on how many steps you took because you could take no more steps than a particular number that the rabbis determined. If you did, you had violated the commandment. You have violated the Sabbath. You've worked too much. You see, see little tidbits like that that we read in the New Testament. That we just about a Sabbath day's journey, and we, we never ask, "What does that mean?" It was a part of the Jewish culture. So Jesus gets up before the people, crowds and crowds and crowds of them. He opens with a singular word that they had never heard in the synagogues, not in context. They hadn't. Blessed. You know. Let me just put it like this and put it on. 
He gets up and he says, your creator, your heavenly father loves you. And he wants to love you back. And you are so blessed. And let me tell you what swells the heart of your heavenly father. It's when you hunger and thirst for his word and the rightness of it, righteousness. When you hunger and thirst to just please him because he's your heavenly papa and you're his child and you just want to please him and you want to keep his word. You want to keep the laws he's given because they're the family rules and you realize that by doing this, you are telling your heavenly father, I love you. And then your heavenly father says, I see that love, and I want to keep blessing you. Blessed are you. You are so blessed, your heavenly father. Lord. I ain't never heard of nothing like that in the synagogue. The first words out of his mouth. What they hear in the synagogue is, we got more rules for you. We've got more regulations. We've got more interpretation of the laws that are in the Word of God, but God speaks through us to you, and we've devised 12 more this week. See how smart we are. And if you would live like we live, God would love you more. Which is why Jesus would later get on to the Pharisees and say, you know what, you heap burdens upon people's backs that you yourself can't even live. See, that's the context of that. They were continually taking God's word and adding burdens and rules and regulations and traditions. And that's why Jesus would later say to them, you nullified by the word of God by holding to your stinking traditions. You see the context? So you see when Jesus gets up, you can see why the Pharisees are now mad and the people are going, nobody's ever spoken like this before. Every time he opens his mouth, I feel like I'm up next to the throne of God. Every time he begins to speak, I feel like I'm looking at God himself. Uh, well, <laughs> well, <laughs> they were. They just didn't know it quite yet, not to the fullest, but they were. Maybe that's why they felt that way. And so he begins, blessed are you, you know, just, it's just that, that, that voice just rumbled down over the tops of their heads. Blessed are you, 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 you. When you hunger and thirst to draw near to the heart of your Creator because He blesses you back and He honors it when you draw up next to Him and just say, Heavenly Father, I love you. Thank you for my heartbeat. Thank you for the breath. Thank you for my life. Thank you for the meal before me. Thank you for my family. Thank you for my friends. Thank you for my church family. Thank you for the blessings of life. Blessed are you. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who are just humbly walking before the Lord, desiring to hear from him because, see, you will inherit the earth one day. You, you know, the prayer that he would teach in this same sermon a little bit later on. Our Papa in heaven, <laughs> our Father. But it says Abba, Aramaic word for, it's a little more kin to Daddy or Papa. Our Papa who's in heaven, the creator of the heavens and earth, but holy is your name. What did he teach him to pray? Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done one day on earth. In a recreated paradise when everything is made new as it right now already is in heaven. And then it gets real personal and just, just take care of us day by day, Lord. And, and, and help me. Help me to forgive people. Help me to be a, a, a peacemaker. Help me to be humble. Help me to walk meekly before the world and before you. I mean, that, that's what he teaches them to pray. And it comes out of what he's just taught them in what we've just read. So you're hungering and thirsting for righteousness. That means, I, God, listen, it's like Paul said. You see, the things I don't want to do, I do. The things I do want to do, I don't. What a wretched man I am. But thanks be unto God through Jesus Christ. Through him I can do all things, right? 
Th- that's what that means. When you hunger and thirst for that, can you sense that when Paul speaks that? He understood he was struggling against the sin nature, but he never doubted that he was under the blood. He never doubted that the righteousness that God saw in him was the blood of Jesus. But once you draw close to the Lord like that, once you begin to hunger and thirst for his heart, once the light of the Shekinah glory shines on you, a weird thing happens. You realize how filthy you are. But that should then inspire worship. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. See, I don't need another rule in law and regulation. I need salvation. I need the blood of Jesus. So Jesus stands on the hillside that day, and this is what he's preaching. Blessed are you, and blessed are you when you want to be a peacekeeper. Man, God will call you. Now there's my child. We can't always be, you know, Paul later tells us, look, live at peace with everybody as much as it is possible with you, right? I love that honesty there. Some people won't let you live at peace with them, so you just walk, you just stay away from them. You know, it's what I call one-way forgiveness. You Sometimes you have to do that. You say, well, how do I forgive somebody? It spits in my face every time they see me. You forgive them before the Lord, and then you stay away from their spit. <laughs> now, if they come to you later and say, I've been spitting in your face, and I'm an idiot. Please forgive me. All right, now you might have the restoration of a brother or sister, right? But that's what it means. Blessed are you when you're, you're, you know, blessed are the peacemakers, those that look to, instead of stirring up dissension and strife and trying to pay people back and vengeance, but blessed, if your heart is one of, look, if there's any way I can make peace here, I'm going to. If I can't, then I'll just turn it over to the Lord and walk away from it. God says, blessed are you. See, God will call you. Now, there's my daughter. There's my son. You will be called the Bene Elohim, the children of God. Do you, do you understand what Jesus was preaching now? I mean, in our Western mind, 2,000 years later, they just sound like just little beautiful poetic words. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the humble. Blessed are the me. Blessed are they when they hunger and thirst for righteousness. Well, they are beautiful words. But when you understand the context. So, so, so the people are there. Jesus is bringing this. And then he gets real personal with it. He brings it right down to their lives. Now, this is where it gets really, really exciting to me. Because then he says, and by the way, blessed are you when you are persecuted. First, you are blessed when you're persecuted for righteousness sake. That is, you're just trying to live for God. You want to do the right thing at the right time for the right reason because God has told you. Blessed are you. The Lord sees that. He will honor that. He will bless you now, but even more importantly, you do realize we're going to live a lot longer in his presence than we're going to live on this earth in this filth, right? You do understand that, right? 60, 70, 80, 90 years if we're blessed here, and that's it. Eternity and glory if you're covered in the blood of Jesus. He says, so I'll bless you here. I know how to bless you here. I know how to bless you in the midst of this mess, but more importantly, Blessed are you in the future that is to come that's right around the corner for all of us. Right around the corner for all of us. Eighty years from now, even the smallest children in here probably won't be. We'll be before the Lord. Right around the corner for all of us. Jesus said, blessed are you when you're going out there in the world and you're just trying to be an ambassador for the kingdom. And you're just trying to love folks. And you're just trying to tell them some good news. And you're just going, I know you got to go against the culture. Folks, have you noticed we live in Babylon now? <laughs> have you noticed we live in Sodom and Gomorrah now? <laughs> have you noticed that the spirit of Babylon and Sodom and Gomorrah have now swept the globe? We're the first generation to live in the age of instantaneous communication information systems. And it's going. That spirit is permeating. It's, all, it's the spirit of Antichrist, by the way. Yeah, it's going to eventually personify. But, I mean, we're headed that way. I don't know. I don't set dates. I, I, I don't know when, where, but I'm just saying. So how did Daniel live in the midst of Babylon? Faithful to the Lord God, but honorable before the king as much as the king would let him be. Yeah, when the king says, you can't pray anymore, Daniel says, what do you mean? Well, you can't pray publicly. Yeah. Okay, Daniel says, okay, okay. I'll obey the king. I'm not going to pray in the government buildings. But he goes home and prays, and they sent spies, and they came back and lied on him. And the next thing you know, he's in the lion's den. But he, because he would not compromise, he, he lived in Babylon. But what did God do? He protected him in the midst of it. 
and he used him and he honored him. That's what Jesus is telling the crowds. Look, I know you live in the Roman Empire. <laughs> and you're going to be persecuted. Because they're worshiping their emperors. And they're worshiping the mythological, well, they're not really mythological, they're demons is what they're worshiping. But they're worshiping the gods, a little g, of the Greeks and the Romans and the pagans that they had assimilated into their culture. And he says, so you're going to go out and you're going to live for your creator. Blessed are you. Then he says, and blessed are you when you're persecuted for my sake. That was a little hint he dropped that day. That God in the flesh is standing right here in front of you. And then he said something they had never heard in synagogue. See, the Pharisees considered themselves the keeper of the light, if you will. They considered themselves the protector of the word. They considered themselves the change agents by keeping rules and regulations and laws and passing them down to the people and lording it over the people and so that the people would all be like lemmings and you know lockstep with their rules and regulations and laws and and then, and then that way they were going to you know they were going to change among the Jewish people and turn all of them into little robots of where they had decided in their little conclaves but then Jesus looked over that crowd <laughs> and he said but you are the change agents. You are the salt of the earth. You are. It's not the religious leaders in the black robes and the collars. You are. You are the salt of the earth. And don't you let anybody take that saltiness from you. Don't be afraid to stand up and be the salt because if you lose your saltiness, you will be trampled underfoot. The church in America is being trampled underfoot because it's lost its saltiness. It's afraid to speak to the evil that permeates our culture. And so we're losing the saltiness. And you know what? We're being trampled underfoot. Supreme Court rulings. We don't know what a marriage is anymore. We don't know what a gender is anymore. We don't know what manhood is. We don't know what womanhood is. We don't know what childhood is. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of people out there just violating it. Why? Church lost its saltiness. Sometime back, I don't know exactly, exactly when it happened, probably about 100 years ago when we decided we were going to start teaching all of our generations that they came from monkeys and there is no God and you are a cosmic accident. That's the law. That's the rule. That's what we're going to teach. And now we're paying the consequences because those that grew up under those generations are now our congressmen and our judges and our movers and shakers and our industry and business owners and our educators. Not all of them, but I'm just saying. You understand? That's what happens. We've lost our saltiness. And you know what else some of those people that grew up under those days? They're preachers and Sunday school teachers and leaders in churches. And they preach the Bible like it's a book of fairy tales because they can't, they can't get it in their head, all the stuff they've been taught about. Well, you know, evolution, all scientists believe. Okay? Jesus is telling them that now. Don't you understand? It's on you. It's on you. You're the salt. And people are going, oh my gosh, you mean my life has meaning and worth and value and dignity before the throne of God? You mean I'm somebody? <laughs> I'm the ambassador of the kingdom? Oh my gosh. I mean, this is what they were hearing. Are you, do you get it? This is what they were hearing. And then he says, and you are the light of the world. You are the keepers of the light. You are the disseminators of truth. Especially when you've hungered and thirsted for righteousness. Especially when you've drawn up next to the heart of God. Especially when he keeps his promise, implores and pours his blessings into your life. And when you pray and your prayers are answered. And when you ask for healing and you're healed. You ask for deliverance and you're delivered. And you see that and you experience that you're touching the throne of God. And you didn't have to go through a rabbi for that to happen. You are. You're the light. Nobody takes a light and puts a basket over it. So let your light shine. Why? So that when people see what God's doing in your life, your whole life becomes a testimony before a world of darkness and people are drawn to the light and they say, what's going on? Can I have what you have? Yes, draw near to the heart of your creator and live for him. Hunger and thirst for the righteousness of God's word and God's heart. And you can have what I have. 
course, now we would say, and come to his son, Jesus Christ. Get under the blood like I have. Amen? Okay, so this is what they're hearing, mind you. And the people are going, wow. And the Pharisees are going, ah, he's treading on our territory. Now that, that little portion there that Jesus we concluded with, now that goes on for a couple of chapters, the whole sermon, but I'm, I'm going to stop there. Aren't you glad? Because it's taken me this long to get here. I mean, can you imagine? <laughs> but so when he gets to that last little section we read, and he starts talking about not one stroke of the pen, not one little letter will disappear from the Word of God. I didn't come to make it disappear. I didn't come to deconstruct it. But I came to live it, to fill it full. You see, that's why John would start his gospel. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was God. And oh, by the way, the Word was with God. And oh, by the way, the Word was God. And oh, by the way, that same Word became flesh and lived it among you. That's what Jesus is telling the crowds. He said, I've come to live it before you. I've come to fulfill it. And then he says, I'm just going to paraphrase, but this is what he says. And cursed are those that twist and pervert the word and teach others to do it. Cursed are they. Blessed are you when you just hunger and thirst for a living relationship with your creator. Cursed are they that take that word that is now standing before you in the flesh and twist it and pervert it for their own power and pleasure and to gain wealth from it. Cursed are they. And then he says to those crowds, and I tell you the truth, Unless, and I think Jesus made air quotes, I'm going to make them, your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You know what he just said? He just said all the Pharisees are lost going to hell. <laughs> That's what he said. He said because they're, they're depending upon their righteousness. They're depending upon what they all decided in a little group last week and passed a bunch of laws and they showed up in the synagogue with them and, so that they could keep their power and control over the people. But to them, that was their righteousness. Now, God, did you see what we did? And, you know, Lord, look at my tithe. Look at that sinner over there in the temple. Remember, remember the, the parable Jesus told? That's, that's how they lived. Not all of them. I mean, there were some Nicodemuses in the crowd, some Arimatheos. He was a part of the Sanhedrin council. Those two guys. I mean, they, 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 they got it. They were seeking. They were thirsting. They, I mean, they risked their lives to go get the body of Jesus, and to give him a rich man's burial. But most of them were of the ilk of, "This is my territory. How dare you tread on my territory?" Look, he's got crowds of thousands and thousands. We go to the synagogue. And there's a couple of hundred. You see? So Jesus stands and with freshness he smiles. I'm convinced Jesus smiled a lot, aren't y'all? He smiles. He sees the crowds. His disciples around him. I bet he elbowed him. Look at this. <laughs> now y'all sit down. Listen, I'm going to tell them something. And you guys get ready because uh, I'm getting ready to tell the Pharisees they're all going to hell. <laughs> so y'all just kind of get ready. <laughs> and I'm getting ready to tell the crowds that they can get to heaven Ahead of the Pharisees. So just, you know, down in the south, and you've heard this up here in Ohio, I'm sure, but we have a saying down in the south, you know, what's the famous last words of a redneck? You know, hey, y'all watch this. <laughs> y'all, we're crazy down there, I'm telling you. <laughs> hey, y'all, watch this. <laughs> and then something stupid happens, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, Jesus wasn't being stupid, and this is the Lord God, but he basically did the same thing with those guys. Hey, y'all, because it says he gathered his disciples around him. The crowds are there, and, and, and I'm filling in what it doesn't say. Hey, y'all, watch this. Keep your eye on the Pharisees. <laughs> watch this. You are blessed. 
Not them because they have a black robe on. You are blessed. God blesses you. God loves you. Even in your confusion, confusion, even in your lostness. Of course he knows you live in a fallen creation. He was there when it fell. He pronounced the judgment on it. The whole thing God is doing, the whole reason I'm here, Jesus would, would say, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but this is the heart of the message. The whole reason I'm here is to redeem you back to the Father that loves you. And so you're blessed this day. You know what he probably wished he could say, but it wasn't time. You're blessed this day because you're looking into the face of your creator who has put on flesh to identify with his creation. Do you have any idea how blessed you are? And I've come to tell you, oh, I didn't come to destroy the word. Those guys are doing that. <laughs> I've come to live it before you and to fulfill it, to show you what God was doing all along. You remember the Passover lamb that you, your forefathers had to slay back in? Well, well, I'm him. You know the Passover meal you take? But well, it's all about me. You know, the Feast of First Fruits, that's all about me. You'll see the third day after you crucify me. You know, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that's me. You know, where I was born, I was born in Bethlehem, Hebrew for the house of bread. You know where my headquarters is? The village of the Comforter. I mean, see, everything he did matched the heart of God. And he was standing on that hillside that, that day, the breeze blowing the seagulls squawking and diving, but the crowds now in a hushed roll because he had their attention. Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the... Well, how can our righteousness surpass the righteousness of, of these lawmakers, these rule givers, these religious elite? Well... It can't. Um, well, if I keep all the Ten Commandments, but you can't. Try it. <laughs> Most Christians in America can't even recite the Ten Commandments. Most Christians in America can't even tell you the two places they're found. Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5. Okay. Yeah. You, you understand what I'm saying? Say, well, I'm just going to get to heaven by being a good person. Really, give me the Ten Commandments. Start with ten. And by the way, have you ever broken any of them? Okay, you're not a good person. Seven billion people on the planet. We're all lost. We're all fallen. We don't need more rules and regulations. What do we need? We need a Savior. We need the blood of Jesus. We need the infilling of the Holy Spirit to birth us again. And that's the righteousness of God that comes upon us. That's the righteousness he sees. That's what he meant when he said, your righteousness has to surpass that of those guys. Well, how is that? You seek your Father's heart. And he will pour out his righteousness on you. Now, when the gospel is birthed through the one that's speaking this, and he goes to the cross, he rises from the grave, then they understood in full. That's the righteousness. It's the name of Jesus. It's the blood of Jesus. It's being born again, like he told Nicodemus. Nicodemus, you need to be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. And that only comes by the Holy Spirit of God. And that only comes when you come before the throne of God and say, Lord, I'm tired of Babylon and Sodom and Gomorrah filling my mind. I'm hungering and thirsting for your truth, for your righteousness before your throne. I, I want to be called a child of God. And we cry out to Jesus Christ. Romans 10, 9. For if you would confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord... And believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. Then you shall be saved. Romans 10, 13. And whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the righteousness that Jesus was speaking of. Now, folks, please hear me. We're going to leave here in just a few moments. So what do you take with you? This is it. Your day-by-day-by-day-by-day by day by day life 
is not really nearly so much about perfection every day as it is about direction. Keeping your eyes on Jesus, keeping your eyes on the throne, hungering and thirsting after righteousness. And when you are tempted, often you can overcome it by prayer and getting in the word and calling upon the name of Jesus. But when you succumb, you repent of it. You make whatever concession you need to make. If it's been with another brother or sister or if it's been before God alone, you get it right. You keep your eyes on the Lord. You do not back up. You do not buckle under. You stand up. You keep your head on your shoulders. You keep your eyes on Jesus and you keep pressing on. Forget what lies behind, Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, and press on towards the prize to which Christ Jesus has called us heavenward. Only let us live up to what God has already done for us. That's what Paul says. I'll close with this little illustration of how that is so true and how it works. So I've been the pastor in one church for 33 years. How many of you know it's hard to fake being a Christian for 33 years in front of the same eyes? And generations and generations and generations. I mean, you got to be like a magician to fake that, right? I mean, 33 years, come on. I mean, my wife and I have lived more of our life with these people than we had before we came to them. You can't fake that. So now, if you were to run into one of my church members somewhere, and you would say, hey, Pastor Carl was, you know, he was in our church or he was at the conference and we met him. And man, he's a wonderful guy and we love him. And y'all would say that, right? Okay, I just want to make sure. Okay, so you're, you're, you're going through that. And then you say, oh, you're so blessed to be under that man. You'd say that too, right? Uh, okay, okay. And then, but, but, but watch, I'm getting to the point. And then you would say, and, and they're standing there looking at you and smiling and, you know, and yes, 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 well, well, thank you. You're so sweet. And then you would say to them, this guy. He's, he's like, he must be perfect, right? They would laugh so hard that spit, spittle, would come out, spittle would come out of their mouth while they're laughing. You, you, you know, people that do that start laughing. You go, golly, man. Got a towel? Okay, okay, okay. now why would, they, why, why would they? See, but after they've calmed down, then you might look with some shock. He's not perfect? No, no, no. But then, then they might be led to ask, well, but is he for real? I mean, does he love the Lord? Of course. That's why we're pastoring people for three decades. He loves the Lord. He's for real. When he messes up, he makes it right. Sometimes he's come before us and said it publicly and made it right. And, and, and then he lives it. And when he messes up, he gets that right. And he gets up and he keeps going. See, now, I, I, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm just a guy. Like y'all and my folks know that. They've raised me from a, from a young man into an old man. They, that's how we do it. And and I'm going to say, listen, Paul said, anything you've seen in me that you can emulate, anything godly, anything, he says, then then do that. You know know what Paul was saying? I'm going to say it to you. If I can do it, you can do it. If I can do it, you can do it. There's nothing special about me. I don't have on Superman underwear. (laughs) You ever see these little kids in a grocery store with their little superhero underwear on and everything? It's just me. It's just you. And, you know, I may have the gift of preaching and teaching and being a pastor, but, but that doesn't make me any better or different or more holy than you. We're brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. You have your gifts. I have mine. We use them together. We're the body of Christ. God honors it. He blesses it. But how do we live in Babylon? You just keep, you stay real, and you press on. You stay real, and you press on. Like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, like Lot, in his day, like Noah and his family in his day. You just press on, press on, press on. God may call you to build an ark. He may send angels and say, come with me, (laughs) okay? (laughs) You might be thrown in a den of lions, and then the Son of God himself shows up to deliver you. We don't know, but we have to be real and press on in Jesus Christ. That's the righteousness that opens the portal to heaven like that thief on the cross when Jesus said, oh, my dear son, today you're going to be with me in paradise. How many rules and regulations had he broken in his life? How many rules and regulations had he kept in the moment? No, he just looked at him and said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That's a, that's a quick sinner's prayer. And Jesus turned and looked at him, and I think through all of the blood in his face, and all of the pain in his bones, I think he smiled at the guy. 
And I think he said, today, you and me are going to walk through a portal instantly. You'll see a flash of light in a few minutes. The atmosphere will shimmer and there'll be a curtain. No one else will see it but you and me. And we're going to walk right through it. And you'll be in paradise. <laughs>